Are you a fan of pro wrestling, comedy, and combat sports? Then we have a podcast for you because we cover that and much, much more. Do you like to debate with your friends? Do we have the perfect segment for you? It's the 531 where we take any given subject, break it down to a top five. From there, we debate it down to three and then into that number one spot. If you want to get a hold of us, find us on our social media. Search Working Fans Podcast on any major social media platform. And if you want to find the podcast, search for us on any major podcast platform as well as YouTube. Working Fans Podcast. We put in the work so you don't have to. Welcome to episode one of Working Fans GamerCast, brought to you by the Pro Wrestling Vault Volume 1 and Lance by Chance, available at WrestleVille.com. Super Vows and Pas de Deux, written by Kevin Kelton, available on Amazon.com, as well as I'll Be Here All Week by Ward Anderson and Blood and Fire, the unbelievable real-life story of wrestling's original sheet by Brian R. Solomon. We are brought to you by AO Money Meach. When the Deadbolt Breaks, Buzzard Canyon, the great people over at Connecticut People Records, our wrestling commentary home of New Heights Wrestling, and we could not do a video game cast without the artist who brought you the fog, Camouflage. Cam, how are you doing today? What's up? What's now, up? What's before up? we kind of get into video games in the history leading up to the kind of 8-bit and arcade era tell everybody about your fandom and kind of what video games mean to you okay so that's that's a loaded question but i'll try to start at the beginning of when i kind of found video games um my earliest i guess video game exposure was probably when I was about five years old. I want to even say before that, if my mom were here, she'd be able to give you a direct um, time frame. But the first, my first introduction to video games was, you know, four or five, and it was on a Sega Genesis console. And my, this is when my parents were still together, and my uncle Mikey um, had a Genesis, and he was playing this game called Streets of Rage. Um, for anybody oh, that doesn't wow. know what Streets of Rage is, they actually just recently, as of like this year, released a Streets of Rage like sequel for the you know, next gen and current consoles. And you play as it's like a side scroller beat 'em up game where you play as like gangsters. You, well, you don't play as gangsters, you play as like maybe three different characters and you, you know, side scroll around the streets and you beat people up. Um, that was my first experience in games, and my mom thought it was okay. And, you know, because it was my uncle and I was playing with him and I just fell in love with those things and my dad hated it. He just hated everything video games. But that's where things started for me. And over the years, um, video games have been a major part of my life, major part of my artistry. Um, I, I mean, as you can see, like most of most of who I am is a large portion of that is, you know, part video games you know so yeah that's where that's where it all started for me and i th I don't think there's been a console that's released or came out since then that i didn't kind of have my hands on i never owned a sega genesis my uncle always did but after i fell in love with that console my mom bought me and my little brother a super nintendo and the super nintendo back in the day was bundled with donkey kong country and me and my brother started with that and we played Donkey Kong Country cooperatively and we beat that. And from there, just, I still have, I still have a lot of the original Super Nintendo games, like still from when I was a kid and I like, I never let them go just because I knew one day, this is Rage. Some of y'all don't know what Rage is, but that was the first game where animals used to fight. There was Monopoly, 
Michael Jordan. This is probably worth some money. I don't know, but I still oh, I held wow. on to him. Yeah, I still held on to them just because they have such good memories, you know. Yeah, video games are so sentimental for people our age because I'd say a generation older than us, you couldn't imagine an adult playing video games for very long unless right. it was with like a younger niece or a son right. or a daughter. And now, like, as adults, we buy video game systems, we buy video game accessories. Mm -hmm. If you look at FYE, they've almost changed their whole business plan around to sell, like, I mean, all kinds of pop culture stuff. Like Funko Pops, a video game pop-up t-shirt. It's Mm -hmm. become its own industry. And, you know, now adults play them all the time. Everybody's got them on their phone. It's permeated culture. But at one time, it was, you know, the thing of, like... It, yeah. it wasn't it was it wasn't something even when I was growing up and as, as a young kid, it was sort of something that was uh, kind of uh, reserved for like younger audiences or nerds. You yeah, know? I was going to say it's definitely like a nerddom to it. Like, oh, yeah. you're into video games. Right. And it's still there's still a, a small portion of the world that still believes that even though you can't like video games are kind of synonymous with pop culture now. You can't get away from video. There's no way that you can get away from them now. Like in in the 90s, maybe the 80s, you could have ignored video games. But now there's commercials, there's stores dedicated specifically to them. There's entire electronic sections in Walmarts and Targets that were, I mean, the world has kind of made its way around video games now to say, well, this is is here now. I guess we got to have a section for it. I guess we got to have stores. Guess McDonald's is gonna have to start making toys after video games. It's just part of, it's just part of life now, you know. Yeah, so. and if you look at where video games started, the first generation of video games, like in the before video games, pinball games and other odd setups sure. like that w- made up arcades. And then by yeah. the '70s, the cabinet started hitting arcades. It was probably like the late '50s video games started as almost like computer exercises like right, can we right. do this and tennis for two space war computer space all these weird like home palm i don't know if you you you're part of you're in my era of of gaming but i i recall growing up and in grade school having you know the the computers that they would have in school back when computers were you know five feet in the back um do you remember oregon trail yeah, and, that was a big one that a lot of people played. And there were other... Yeah, those were games that like helped you with math and storytelling. And a lot of people don't know this, but Microsoft's first actual video game was Microsoft Flight Simulator. And that was yeah. that's now probably one of the largest games of all time, at least like size-wise. And it's a technical masterpiece if you've ever played microsoft flight simulator you probably notice how expansive it is and how crazy the graphics are every plane is super unique you can spend a literal in-game like in real life day days flying from here to japan or wherever you want in these one-to-one replicas of real life flying aircrafts you know so it's like they've come a long way from Microsoft Flight Simulator and when did they come out with the 80s? I don't know when the first game came out, but to now it's absolutely insane. So it's just a testament to how, how you know, the, the timeline of video games will probably never end. It's just what they will be in, you know, generation after generation. We've seen VR. We've went from 8-bit you know, arcade cabinets. We've went to, you know, to home consoles, to VR, and who knows? Now there's going to be altered reality games soon, you know? It's wild. Yep. Now, I use the textbook, the video game textbook by Dr. Dr. Brian J. Wardigi. Should have practiced the pronunciation, but this is the history, business, and technology. And that's where a lot of these details come from now. They brought up the key figure in the first generation was Ralph Bayer. He developed the first home video game console, the Magnavox Odyssey. 
and mm-hmm. that's way before my time. Like Atari, I was playing it, but it was definitely like the older system at that point. And yeah, that's how I first yeah. became. Yep. That's how I first became aware of video games was my babysitter, who was kind of like an older cousin to me, had this Atari system. And the first time you see somebody open up that video game case and you have like 10 titles to choose from, that will blow your mind because you're like, do I want to <laughs> yeah. play T? Do I want to play baseball? No right. matter how shitty the graphics, like at that point, that's like technology and like. Mm-hmm space invaders anything where like you're shooting the things coming down at you you're like this is amazing now some the top 10 features that define first generation games it's kind it's a little technical based but it said discrete transistor based digital game logic dedicated console games were built in rather than using removable media so i think the games were programmed into the system rather right. than having cartridges that pop in. Right. Light gun right. peripheral and paddle style analog controllers. Because if you think about almost, I'm sure before Pong, that turning controller was, you know, the height of technology. Right. All first generation play fields occupied a single screen. Graphics yes. consisted of basic lines, dots, and blocks. It was mostly monochrome or dichromatic combination. One weird thing I saw was they had these color overlays that you could put on your TV that was just basically like see-through plastic mm-hmm. that gave the basic almost Pong design. Yeah. gave it a little more flavor, and that was interesting to see. Some games that they develop, some indie developers or even you know AAA developers will have a filter that they yeah. can put in their games that will give the game that kind of old retro vibe. And I think that's really unique when devs do that because it's kind of like a callback to the earlier graphics of, you know, the early, sometimes even the early 90s or 80s. And that's usually pretty cool. But I usually find myself toggling that option just to see what it would have felt like if I were, you know, five again. And then yeah. I'll usually quickly switch back to the updated graphics or whatever, but it's always cool when that option is there to kind of see that toggle switch of, oh, this is what things would have looked like if it were like monochromatic or if it was, you know, 8-bit from 1980 something. And I'm like, whoa. Yeah, it's fun to dip into, but like we get so used to these newer graphics that you can only do it for so long. For so long. It's, It's hard to go back that far. Now, the Coleco Telstar series was the best seller of this generation with over 1.5 million sold, which I thought... Cole- ColecoVision. Is that what it was called? The ColecoVision. I think this might be just... The full, before... the full name was Coleco Television, but everyone called it ColecoVision. Oh, this might be just before that, because in the second generation oh. of games, it's got ColecoVision in there. Some of these like go into the second generation. The second generation of gaming systems was the Atari VCS, Magnavox Odyssey, Mattel and Television, ColecoVision, and Atari 1500, which Mm -hmm. we can take a look at the Magnavox Odyssey right here. That definitely looks like a throwback. Yeah. (laughs) And then the Atari, which there's something about a video game system box that even right. to this age excites me. It's like if hey. you put the game that's included in there on the outside of the box, I'm like, I cannot wait to dig into this. It's like opening mm-hmm. a present. I can't wait to open it. I keep all my video game boxes. That's a little known secret, at least within reason, within reason. Like I still have my Series X box from when I got that a while ago. I have my original Xbox box. I, I, what, why I usually keep them now is because I know that I'm going to move from, you know, I'm, I'm in an apartment. I'm going to move eventually from here. And I know there's no better box to really put your game system in than the box it came in. And that's usually the best way to protect them. So I always keep things crisp. But um, there's nothing more satisfying. Even when you used to get video games in cases, like they hit different when 
you get video games in cases and then oh, the them. classic halo 2 aluminum yeah. i had that i love yeah games. there was something about opening this or games like this in the the instruction manual that you could read on the way home after you begged mom to you know take you to gamestop or funko land a lot of kids don't even know that funko land was way before gamestop or you know whatever whatever game you got even if it was a super nintendo game you'd open it up in the the booklet would be in there and you would just read that thing all the way home and look at how chunky this is like that i remember super nintendo games used to have a a bible of pages and you would know how to play the game before you even got home you'd know the backstory of donkey kong you'd know the what happened in halo 1 and what led to halo 2 and i think a lot of that changes with uh, you know like money saving i think over time companies want to save money and they don't really want to spend the money on you know this stuff because they don't really find the value in it like people who grew up with it did but i miss that era man whenever i even see a piece of paper in a video game box now i get a slight hint of nostalgia and i'm like yes they want us to care about this game enough. But there was that something- That booklet isn't enough anymore. Sometimes it's just I like know. a cardboard slip now and it yeah. there's no instructions. There's just nope. like- Nope, they want you to take that game home code. and install it. Yeah, yep. oh, yes, like, right. A downloadable code for- uh, Or an DLC. advertisement for some other thing they Yeah, oh, I miss those, man. Now, the second generation of games kind of included the golden era of arcade games. And I'm going to give you the top arcade games by year from the arcade golden games? era. Game games for the business. And are we talking like MAME arcades or the games themselves in the arcades? These are, I think, the top arcade cabinets because 78 was Space Invaders, 79 oh, okay. was Galaxian. Yeah. Hey. Oh, Pac-Man's got to be up there somewhere, right? 1980 is Pac-Man. I knew it. I knew the it. The top-grossing arcade game of all time, by the way. Was, was Pac-Man? What's that? Was Pac-Man? Yes, it was. Believable. Yep. 1981 was Donkey Kong. Mm. 1982 was Pole Position. And 1983 was Dragon's Lair. Yeah, for sure. For sure. A lot, now, of people, key, a lot of people don't know that Donkey Kong didn't just come out from Donkey Kong Country and Super Nintendo. Donkey Kong actually started off as a villain in uh in I guess in, in his own in his own right because uh Mario Mario was the character that was supposed to save the princess was Mario and you played as Mario trying to get up these ladders and stuff to defeat Donkey Kong who was consistently throwing barrels at you. But younger generation, or I should say current like generations of kids would not know that Donkey Kong started out as a villain and Super Mario has always been saving hoes. So, I mean, it's just crazy how far they, you know, they both came a long way. I know. And when I was young, it was confusing that there was this Super Mario Brothers game that I knew, and mm -hmm. then there was this Mario Brothers game, which was like Donkey Kong Part 2, kind of, because it had right. Donkey right. Kong, but then you had the Mario Brothers, and it just blew my mind. The key figure from this time frame was Nolan Bushnell, who he mainstreamed video games with Pong and the Atari VCS. He founded Atari, and he pioneered Pizza Time Theater, which became the successful Chuck E. Cheese arcade Chuck e. Cheese. chain. Yep. And that was one of maybe like the gateways for young people right, to, to get into yeah. arcade games mm -hmm. besides like the regular arcade that would pop up at your average mall or something like that. Yeah. Top 10 features that define the second generation were microprocessor driven game logic, interchangeable ROM cartridges for an unlimited number of games. So I think they started introducing like separate cartridges for each right. game computer simulated opponents for single player games 
12 button numeric keypad controllers. So you can see the controllers are developing. It's not just paddle or maybe a simple button. A simple button like on the Atari. Yep. There was non-scrolling single screen play fields for most games. Multi-screen play fields spanning multiple screen areas for some games. Blocky simple sprites with screen resolutions up to 320 by 192 pixels. Color graphics normally between 2 and 16. Multiple audio channels up to 4. And the first time digitized speech in games with P.T. Barnum's Acrobats and Berserk. Berserk? Wow. Yeah, fun. this is still like... The Atari VCS was the top-selling game console at this time with 30 million units the intellivision was second with three million so still before our time you know video games yeah. they're picking up speed because you go from the top system selling 1.5 million units to now you're selling 30 million right and that's going to pick up more with the third generation of gaming which is kind of where our fandom would come in over in japan you had the famicom Sega mm -hmm. SG-1000 and the Sega Mark, but in the U.S. you had the Atari 7800, the Nintendo Entertainment System, which a lot of us grew up on, and then the Sega Master System, which was just yeah, before my great. time, because when I was a kid, it was like Nintendo or the Sega Genesis. Yep. That was our, that's when we pretty much would have came into video game, based on our age now. It was right after Famicom, which was the predecessor right of the regular nintendo so yeah I right think it was just before that, yeah right before and it was a really crazy looking system i had a picture of it in my room actually which is random but it kind of it, you can like picture like a what's that car from back from the future a delorean it looked yes. like a red and white delorean sort of with like weird red buttons on it Man, what did I do with that picture? I, I should have gotten a picture of it because I think you put the cartridge in the top almost like yeah, it would be like a Nintendo cool. cartridge, but right. sticking it in a Super Nintendo. Yep, exactly. And I don't know what yeah. happened with after that, they went to the Nintendo where you were actually sliding your cartridges into this lifted hood, kind of like a VHS, and then you would put the hood down, and that's how you. I, I always thought that was. That's where CDs got their idea from in my in my eyes. I think CDs were like, hmm, I kind of like that whole, you know, lift up the lid. It's all, and the evolution of games kind of just took over and they went back to top loaded cartridges for three more generations, I think, up until Nintendo 64. And then CDs were, you know, took over everything. Yeah, and that was crazy. Nintendo really held on for that cartridge. Like Nintendo's held long. on a long. They if they don't hold on to something for a really long time, they they eventually hold on to it until they can't anymore, and then they just reinvent the wheel. Nintendo went from hard cartridges all the way up to N sixty four. Even while Sega went to Sega CD. Nintendo was like, nah, we're going to keep 60, we're going to, you know, we're going to move up to 64 bit with you, but we're going to keep these cartridges popping. And we were, I was still blowing on cartridges with N64 the same way I was with Nintendo. They were great, but after that, they were like, you know, we don't even want to do regular size CDs. We're going to make micro CDs for GameCube. And that was just like, what? what they yeah i i enjoyed the gamecube but that was just I such an it. odd decision i loved it but it was where you know what where are we at you know i had to you know i had to have some gamecube here like what is this <laughs> no other thing that had this small like you can get something for your pc with i think i had like a windows reboot cd or something like that that was this small but no other game system had cds like this what psp no it's almost I think had some small it's almost like they want to put their own signature onto it while still yeah, trying to keep up with the modern age right. 
Man, Famicom. So where were we at? Famicom, Super, what? That went to Nintendo. Nintendo and, and the Sega Master System. Now, Sega Master listen System. to some of these Nintendo launch titles. You got 10-yard fight, baseball, yep. Clue Clue Land. Here's one I didn't know of. Donkey Kong Jr. Matt. Never heard of the game. I got That's it. what it said it's in that. this textbook. Donkey Kong Jr. Mad? Math. Oh, math. Like That must be some kind of educational game. I I never heard of it, but you had Duck Hunt, Excite Bike, Gyromite, yeah. Hogan's Alley, Ice Climber, Kung Fu, Pinball, Super Mario Brothers, Tennis. You know, when I'd go to rent games when I was younger, some of those like Hogan's Alley, that'd be one that I'd be like, I got to check that out. I remember yeah. loving Excite Bike. Hated the bike overheating. Wow. I'm I'm sorry. I'm like looking at Donkey Kong Jr. math. I'm just I just never knew that was a thing. Me hmm. neither. And that was one of the weird things finding that in this textbook. Now a key figure from this time is Shigeru Miyamoto. He's the Donkey Kong creator, Super Mario Brothers yep. producer, director, designer, Legends of Legend of Zelda producer, director, Star Fox creator, Super Mario Kart producer. Peakman creator producer and wow. Metroid Prime producer. This guy, he has done so much in our fandom and like one of those names that if you weren't delving into the history of games, you might not know. But he's had his fingers, it seems like, on everything. Oh yeah, you he's he's a he's one of those legends that like if you know video games or if you've even had to dabble in a couple years of them like and you've had game informer for some time or you've played nintendo games he's gonna come up at some point like you know who he is anytime he's mentioned at like video game conventions or award shows people go crazy because he's like the grandfather he's the og of 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 games like from the he's the he's the nintendo og pretty much 100 percent. now we're gonna kind of leave it there with third generation but what are some of your favorite Nintendo games and what are some of your favorite arcade games before we go into what you'd like to promote? Okay. So my some of my favorite arcade games, uh, I would have to say my earliest arcade um, exposure would have been, like you, we mentioned earlier, would have been uh, Chuck E. Cheese. When I was younger, I had a birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese, and this would have been sometime after my uncle put me on to Sega Genesis. And, you know, we, I was, you know, addicted as a young age of, you know, to play video games, but I never really had a arcade experience prior to that. And I didn't know what playing an arcade cabinet with people was like. So I think at that time when Chuck E. Cheese was around, I think they're still around today. Um, they had games like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and that was a four-player co-op game. They also had like fight games at the time, like you know the Street Fighters and the, even like earlier ones. And that was my first, I think, arcade cabinet experience, and it still is one of my favorite like games to play at least cooperatively as far as like arcades go. So I would say my top three would probably have to be uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, like Turtles in Time, uh, Street Fighter. And I it maybe if you want to consider this an arcade game, it's more or less, it's, I guess it's like a, a racing game, but I liked Cruising USA growing up. Cruise oh USA. yeah, you would see that in almost every and arcade, and it it was cool just so to fun. watch the screen or watch somebody play. It's yeah, such a great I, I experience. Still, I still love Cruising World and Cruising Future, whatever they have out. Still a big part of um, arcades. There's, I mean, you kind of can't mention arcade racers without saying Cruising in some capacity. Ninja Turtles kind of defined what. Uh, co-op arcade cabinets could kind of be in a way they took like the most popular cartoon and they smashed it into an arcade and said hey you you and three buddies you guys can all be the turtles and fight together 
And while you're at it, grab some more quarters because X-Men's right next to it. And you couldn't get away from that, that fun level. There's no way you could tell me those were not like some of the funnest games. But those were my top three for arcades was Ninja Turtles, Cruising, and probably any Street Fighter cabinet that they had. Um, and you said Super Nintendo games? Which one? Uh, was regular it? Nintendo games. Regular Nintendo? Ooh. Okay. Uh, I had a game called, uh, what was it? Not Darkwing Duck. I don't know if you oh, know Darkwing yeah. Duck. Darkwing yeah. Duck was fire. I had an X-Men game for that. And I'm trying not to, you know, put uh, Mario Bros up there because that's kind of like a, you know, it's given everybody had that and everyone talks about that one. I'm trying to mention the low key fire ones. Um, and then I think there was an Aladdin, but Aladdin was, uh, it might have been Super Nintendo, but whichever one it was, that game was brutally hard, brutally hard. And I think I've spent more child hours on that game than anything else I've played trying to beat it. And it was that hard, but because of that, I think it works its way up into my top three games of that generation before going into Super Nintendo. Nice. Now, thank you for joining us today for episode one. We hope to have you back for future episode here. Before we let you go, though, let us know what you got coming up. I think you got an event to promote. Yeah, well, I actually have a really big, I wish I had the physical flyers on me, but I have a really big event coming up here in Norwich on the 29th, which is next Friday. It is called the Rose City Style and Sound Showcase. I'll, I'm going to be headlining that with Delgado on the, also one of my um, partners and best friends on the label. Um, Young D should be there next Friday too, but it's going to be a fashion uh, runway and uh, showcase for artists. We've got Dame FK, who's actually been on your podcast before, he's going to be a uh, featured performer. Um, uh, myself, uh, Al Delgado goes by Delgado Jack, um, a NBC's uh, famous uh, singer, uh, Braden Sunshine, is actually going to be performing. I don't know if you know who that is, but he's he was really really big on NBA. Uh, sorry, not NBA. NBC's The Voice a couple years ago, and he made it to the finals, and he's actually going to be there. Um, Sarah Christensen, I hope I said her name right. Uh, Melrose Denham is going to be, it's going to be her first fashion runway. She's got a bunch of really awesome models that are going to be showcasing her work. It's going to be a really long event. It's probably going to run from like two all the way like through the night. It's going to be an after party. It's going to be a pool party. There's going to be vendors, all sorts of you know, organic, natural vendors always come through to honest parties. But um, because it is a private event, technically, I can't give the address out on air. But um, if you go to my Facebook page, you know, my, my camouflage face, that's K-A-F-L-A-G-E. I'm the only camouflage in face this face. Go there, you'll see the event plastered right there on the front page. Click the Eventbrite link, and that will give you the address and where you could purchase tickets. And um, that's going to be a, a really big show next Friday, probably one of the bigger ones this summer. And it is open; it is open to the public. You are welcome to come. It's just we can't put the address out, you know, on social media like that. I can't just say it out loud because it's a private location. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us, and we will talk yeah. to you again later, man. Oh yeah, man. So episode one of the Gamer Cast didn't go quite as planned. Originally, it was going to be me and Chris Zauha sitting here with Camouflage talking video games. You saw Camouflage on the first part of this recording. And unfortunately, Chris Zauha is busy handling grocery store business, not wrestling business. So we brought in the man called Dave. He is taking time out of his family's life to sit here and talk video games. Now, Dave. How into video games are you? Like, how deep of a fandom do you have? It's been a while. Uh, okay, I'm a pitch hitter here. All right, I'm here. <laughs> All right, the team, Salha dropped. We hope he's okay. But, baby, I'm here, and we're going to deliver. How deep am I into games, though? Um, so, it's interesting. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, before we talk, I know this is arcade games, and we'll get to that. But to go to my video game fandom, 
I was uh, first introduced to Frogger on a little old computer, you know, trying to get Frog across the street. And then uh, the first system I had, I had an old school Atari. We had Pac-Man. We had Pole Position. Um, beyond that, we eventually did get Nintendo. Got Duck Hunt. And uh, whatever that game was with the robot, Gyromite, maybe? I don't know. It was, yeah, that was an early one. It was early, right. So I came with the robot, and uh, then I got into the Super Mario Brothers games, and uh, there was some other one. Top Gun had a game. <clears throat> there was an old Kung Fu game where you could basically just get down in one position, and you could keep kicking your opponent's legs, and that was a way to win, and it would piss <laughs> off people. I pissed off some friends like that. Uh, and of course, all the wrestling games, never WWE would come out with games, but uh, and it was an early wrestling game too with Starman, I think, was one of the characters. I believe it was called Pro Wrestling, Giant Panther, right? He had like a head, yeah. fight somebody, and uh, of course, uh, at that point in my life, probably the pinnacle of my gangdom, Mike Tyson's punch out, little Mac took me months to defeat the guy from India. Uh, tiger or something uh, because I didn't know you had to sit there and block because I was such a button smasher. I would just basically keep trying to duck and dodge this guy. And all you had to do was just hit block a couple times and you'd be fine. Once we figured that out, once my dad went to talk to the guy down at the video store and he <laughs> found out the trick, we got past him. And then uh, eventually I beat Mike Tyson after a couple months. All right. So you're not, you were never a deep gamer. Like, no, oh, I, 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 I would go on to play the GameCube. Uh, AJ and I would actually end up, uh, you know, in our early 20s, we'd play some games, uh, mostly wrestling games. We did the NWO, WCW, you know, games, uh, WWE, obviously. Um, I don't remember where we last left off. I remember like GameCube and some of the N64 consoles. All right, well, that'll give fans an idea of where you're coming from, so... Yeah. We definitely pulled here. Dave's a team player. I'm going to continue on with a little bit of the talk I had with Camouflage, and I'm going to give you the top 10 features that define the third generation of gaming. This is going to go way over Dave's head, but this is for the people. And this included D-pad game controllers, tile-based play fields with smooth hardware scrolling, the platformer-style video game, detailed sprite graphics with integer sprite zooming to double the sprite size, higher screen resolutions up to 256 by 240 and 320 by 200, multi-dimensional scrolling and diagonal scrolling, enhanced sound up to five channel mono audio, battery backup save feature, which meant the progress can be saved on the cartridge, light gun game popularity, and active shutter stereoscopic 3D glasses. Now, Dave, the third generation of gaming for your information would be like the Atari 7800. Mm-hmm. That would be the one I think a lot of people would be familiar with right before Nintendo, the Nintendo Entertainment System and the Sega Master System. We went over all this with camouflage, but I just wanted to catch you up a little bit. All right. Now, I was going to bring Zauha in and we were 